All right, thank you. So like she said, I'm Michelle Campbell. I am local. I work actually at Lucid Software, which Matthew Barlocker mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, we do diagramming online and uh, publishing software called Lucid Chart and Lucid Press. You may have heard of it. Uh, and I've been working there for about four years now. Uh, I actually started in product support there, realized I really like debugging issues, but I'm not a big fan of talking directly to customers. Um, and so I found out about QA. I, I kind of call it, I fell into QA, because there's no real QA background that you can get in college. But um, I, I fell, fell into it, and I fell in love at the same time. Um, so like I said, I started about four years ago at Lucid, and we had, um, at that time, we were releasing to production every other week. Uh, and it was a big deal. And we have been doing that for three plus years before I even started, I think. Um, and so we have been releasing every other week since the company started, basically. And we kind of got set in the ways of, like, yeah, releasing every other week's fine. And then uh, as we grew, it really wasn't fine to be releasing every other week. Because, like, yeah, if you only have five developers worth of code releasing, then it's you know, not so hard. But once you get to 50 to 100 developers releasing code all at once, all their code that they've worked on for two weeks at once, it becomes a big, arduous deal. Uh, and so we decided, OK, well, one, we definitely want to get to continuous deployment, but we probably can't do it overnight now that we've formed all these habits and we got set in our ways. So we need to you know, create goals along the way to get there. Um, yeah, so our first big main goal is getting to continuous deployment itself. Oh. Um, and so we kind of wrote down how to achieve it. So um, our first main small goal uh, we came up with in August of last year, and that was to be deploying every single week to production by the end of the year. So by December of last year, we wanted to be, to be deploying every single week. And we realized like we had to take a lot of things and to continue to, in, into consideration as we got to weekly deploys. Uh, and I sort of outlined four main things that we had to take into consideration. The first being the people involved, like who needs to be involved in this decision? Who do we need to get together and uh, figure this out and hash it out? Uh, the second being the obstacles that it takes. Like what obstacles do we foresee already that we have to overcome? The third being a timeline. Uh, and then the fourth being uh, all the tools we can put together to make things way more efficient. So. Uh, I really like Lord of the Rings, uh, so we're going, I might be diving full on Lord of the Rings here. So first, the people. Uh, the first is our head of engineering. Uh, he has been at the company almost since it started, um, six, seven years ago. And uh, it has been his goal for as long as I've known him. He is a great guy, and so he wanted to get everyone on board with this big goal. Uh, the second is we really had to consider all of our engineers, not just, you know, DevOps, but like our entire engineering infrastructure and, uh, you know, how it would impact them, what we needed to do to get there. Uh, of course, we needed to consider quality assurance because uh, deploying every week usually means a lot more testing, like almost double the amount of testing we have to do to deploy every single week. Uh, of course, we need to consider our DevOps. Uh, we have a, uh, so for the longest time, we had a dedicated DevOps team. Um, for as long as I've been at Lucid, we've have had one. Uh, and they're great, uh, and they get so many things done. Um, and then we started actually making it so there's an ops member on every single engineering team itself. So we have about seven or eight front end teams and about five or six back end teams. And every single one of those has an ops me member dedicated to helping release code So, for them. Uh, another person to consider are your product managers. They're the ones who really want to um, get to weekly deploys because 
uh, getting code twice as fast out to our users means happy users. Uh, and so they really wanted it too, and they had a lot of say in to how we got there. And then uh, finally, this is the big role. Uh, we sort of made it up. I didn't know if this was a thing before we made it up, but we, uh, I'm sure a lot of other places have these guys, uh, release coordinator and manager. Um, so uh, this is, again, back in August, I was approached um, by our head of engineering and he asked me and two other people, hey, would you guys mind handling our releases? And I was like, okay, sure. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I guess I can do that. Let me figure it out. And so we created a whole list of responsibilities of what it means to be a release coordinator of all the things that you have to make sure are ready because you're the go, no-go guy for the release, right? Like once it comes down to the uh, crunch time, like you have to be able to say, yeah, we're ready or nope, nope, cannot go out. We still have these horrendous blockers. And so like that required us knowing um, if the builds were stable, if um, all the code that needed to get out needed to be out. So having a dedicated person who actually knows your engineering organization, because a lot of it was also going around and knowing what each person was releasing and how they, how they were going about it and what were the risks involved with what they were doing. And so release coordinator is a very good person to have. And I found out later that apparently this job is usually done by a team as well in a lot of bigger companies <laughs> and not just one person at a time. Okay, so next is the obstacles we had to overcome. Uh, the first big one was arduous deploys. Uh, there, our deploys were painful, I'll be honest. Um, we were, again, releasing every other week. And it used to take us a week to make sure the release candidate was stable itself and ready to go out to production. And then once it was ready to go out after a week of full testing and uh, fixing things, um, the deploy happened. And the deploy took like five hours, it felt like, every time. Because, oh, oh, this service is going down. Why is it starting to go slow all of a sudden? Ah, uh, we need to fix that. Roll back, roll back. And like, it was just painful. And so sometimes we would be there until 7 or 8 o'clock at night or even like on the odd occasion like 10 o'clock, uh, just making sure the release could go out and everything was fine. And so we had to change that. We had to make deploys light and easy. Oh, there we are. Uh, another thing is all the habits we've built up over the years. Like this one's a really hard one to overcome. Uh, because you have developers who have been at an organization for so long and they say, this is the way we do things here. And they don't realize like, as your organization grows, you have to change the way you do things. You have to be able to work you know, in a large group and not just you know, the small, itty bitty, like five person engineering team that you, we had when we started. And so we had to break a few habits. And finally, this one's the big one for me, uh, is uh, who's familiar with the term regression testing? OK, a lot of people. Good. I wasn't sure. OK. Um, so the regression for us was also very painful as a tester, because that's where uh, I started into this, is as a QA tester. And oh my goodness, I cannot. It took us five days like to get through the regression and get it done. And, it was a lot to put on us, and uh, I can't even think about those days anymore because it's, it's gotten better. It does get better, everyone. All right, uh, the next thing is making sure you have a timeline. So uh, my point here is, yeah, it's good. Your company wants to get to continuous deployment. We've been saying that for probably six years, seven years at Lucid, that we want to get to continuous deployment. But until last year, we did not have a specific goal to actually do something about it. And so until you have that goal to do it across your whole organization and everyone's on board, not just like the head of engineering, because if it's just this one guy who wants to do it, it can't get done. It has to be an organization-wide effort to get there. And so you need to make your goal and you need to make it known across the organization. 
And so our goal was be at weekly deploys by the end of the year with certain smaller services that we could actually break up uh, being at continuous deployment. So we did achieve this goal, which is the whole point for this talk because it was pretty <laughs> exciting the day it happened. All right, so this is the meat of my talk. Uh, this is all the tools that it took for us to get there. And so I hope you find some new things that you haven't heard before of the tools it took us to get there. So the first one, this is my big one. Uh, it's called Sentinel. Uh, we built it ourselves. Uh, this is just a little user interface that allows us to uh, deploy any code to any machine. Like any developer branch, I can put on any machine within two minutes. Like, and we have 20 different machines for me to test on. So, uh, and this is just a quick, I grabbed the name of the branch from Bitbucket and um, pasted it in here and click install. That's all I have to do to install a branch to test it. Uh, this was a pretty, pretty easy thing for um, one of our ops members to develop. And I think it took him like, I don't know, just a couple of weeks maybe at most in his free time. And like it has made the world of difference. If uh, your testers and um, your developers can't easily deploy code to testing environments, uh, then you're going to be slowed down a lot and you're wasting a lot of time that could just be used elsewhere. Okay, the next thing, this is a bunch of text because I didn't want to forget anything. Uh, you want to formalize just about anything and everything possible. Uh, we came up with a huge list of all the stuff that like, we needed to formalize in order to break those bad habits I was talking about earlier. So first, a scheduled release meeting. So we were in such a bad place, like half the organization didn't even realize we were releasing to production when we were releasing to production. And so actually having a scheduled dedicated time, like we always release Wednesday at 11 a.m. That is the release time. Everyone across the organization knows it and that's when we do it. If we don't do it at that time, it's odd. Um, two, uh, we always have two dedicated ops members to help us release. So uh, it's actually a rotation. So everyone on ops knows how to release to production. Uh, third, an engineer from every team is available and watching the release. So this was one of the big ones for breaking bad habits for us because um, a lot of the problems that I was talking about with arduous deploys came because like a certain team did this thing and we had no idea they did this thing and all of a sudden it's in production and it's breaking this thing over here and we had no idea but all of them are home because it's 10 o'clock at night now and they're probably sleeping. Uh, so we forced every single team, any developer team, you had to have an engineer from your team available for the release and they had to be there until the release was done. Um, and that, that just meant they could fix the problems and we fixed so many problems really quickly and it just became a habit for having, us, for having an engineer there. Um, Tracking the responsible team for each blocker. So for us, the context of blocker means that um, it's the bugs we find that will prevent us from having a production release. Um, and so we actually, over the weeks, we tracked which teams were causing the most issues and tried to figure out the root cause of why this team over here is having so many blockers, but this team over here only has like one or two every now and then. Um, again, the release manager to track the go and no-go status. Um, the release manager also pesters a lot of people. So I am the main release manager at Lucid now. And uh, every time I approach someone's desk, they're always like, I didn't do it. I promise I did not do it, Michelle. Uh, because I just pester people nonstop and say, hey, I have this bug here and it's definitely gonna keep us from releasing and it looks like you broke it whenever I go back in this stack trace. Uh, you got anything to say about that? So like having someone there to make sure those things are going well. Uh, and finally, we also had a dedicated Slack channel for the release. So even if you were working remotely, you could still pay attention to when the release was happening. Whew. Okay, other tools. Um, big 
this was a big deal for us. Uh, like I said, our regression testing was very difficult, very painful. Um, and with the number of testers we had trained, like we could not get it done in time to be able to do it every single week because uh, it was already taking you know, five days to do. So uh, we managed to actually reduce it by to only taking two days to do now, uh, all of our whole regression suite. And um, it's because we got a ton of extra assistance in three different ways. The first way uh, was um, actually doing some outsourced testing. Uh, there's a lot of different programs out there. So like any of our really basic stuff, we could actually outsource to another company, which really, really took a lot of the load off. Um, the second, and this one I think is the most surprising to people when I say like we actually pulled this off. We had almost everyone, we had a rotation every single week, and we still do, of different people across the entire engineering organization who are supposed to help us with testing. So uh, that's UX members help us with the regression. Engineers help us with the regression, and they learn how to do it. Um, and it actually has created quite a bit of benefit because as UX has been doing it, they're like, oh, I didn't realize we even had this part of the product here. It doesn't look that great. I'm going to fix this now. Or as engineers do it, they will say, oh, I didn't realize this was here. This is actually a terrible experience for our users, and I can fix this in like two minutes. Why am I not fixing this right now? Uh, and so it was very beneficial for us to have all these different people help us with the regression. And it turned out like they only needed to help us once a quarter, if that. So it was really great. And then finally, uh, was automation. That was the third thing for us with the extra assistance. Um, so other big tools, uh, automatic get hooks. This will help um, break some of those habits I was talking about earlier because we had the habit of, oh yeah, I guess QA should be testing this. I forgot about that. And so we had a Git hook that said, hey, you don't have a QA member on your pull request. They should be testing your pull request. Why aren't they here? You can't merge this without QA approval. Let's get it done. And so it was just an automatic thing. Anytime you create a pull request, QA got added to your pull request. Um, and then uh, it even told you who you needed to add in certain cases to your pull request. So like I said, some of our services are now actually genuinely continuously deployed. So like once you merge it, it's out there in production. Um, and so in those cases, like you needed to add an ops member to your pull request to get it merged. And so that also told you to add ops members. So uh, there's a lot of things you can do with Git hooks. I would recommend looking into it. That'll uh, make your process a lot easier. Uh, other tools, production like staging environment. Uh, I think I chanted this for a year or so. Like, uh, if your testing environments don't match your production environments on the back end side, like if your services aren't um, connected the same way, then you're going to run into problems. You're not going to catch those big, nasty, hairy bugs as soon as they get to until they get to production because your testing environment does not look like your production environment. Uh, so this is like this is something we actually took care of two years ago. Like it's a big deal. You need to get it done. And then finally, we also had lots and lots of environments. Um, so it, if each tester for your organization doesn't have their own unique environment, it can get kind of hard because like sharing environments and figuring out who, who has this environment, who has this environment, like it just gets frustrating. Make sure you dedicate resources for each tester to have their own actual testing environment so that they can just spin up a developer branch and get it tested. Okay, um, also we moved our team machines to AWS, Amazon Web Services. Uh, so before all of our team machines, so these are like local testing environments I was talking about earlier. They were on physical machines, which was very hard for us. Uh, like I was the one maintaining those physical machines at one point, and they just broke for the most random <laughs> reasons. It was extremely painful, but now that they're in AWS, it, it almost, it pretty much always works very easily, very smoothly. So uh, get those team machines off of a little laptop in your, if you can. 
Um, I also mentioned earlier improved test automation practices. Uh, this one was very huge for us. Uh, we didn't have a dedicated automation team for a good while until like about a year and a half ago. And um, almost no one across the engineering organization, it was very common to hear like, oh, that's just a flaky test. It's not going to work. And all I could think is, if it's a flaky test, why do we still have it? Like, just get rid of it. And so <laughs> what's the point? Um, I would highly recommend reading the blog called Flaky Test, the tester's F word. Like, it's, <laughs> it's great. Um, so what we actually did is we had someone dedicated to making sure our automation framework and all of our automation tests actually worked and that people started trusting them again. That when they failed, if an automation test failed, you actually believed it failed for a reason and not just it failed. Um, and then, yeah, there we go. And finally, this is, this is the big one uh, that really helped us was communication, communication, communication. Like I said, uh, across the whole engineering organization, like it was a big deal that everyone knew like we were trying to get to weekly release. This is huge, we need to get it done. Uh, and then we also made sure not just in engineering, because we're like, we're almost 400 people now, which is a huge growth and uh, that all of our product support knew, all of our customer success knew, all of our sales knew we were trying to do this because this was a big point for them because it meant that they could get things out to their users faster. The people who write in and say, hey, I have this problem. It means like instead of waiting two weeks for a fix, they only needed to wait one week. Um, and then we also made sure we, as we were leading up to our goal of getting to weekly releases by the end of the year, we made sure that each person involved had a defined assignment and that they knew what they were doing. For instance, I was the release coordinator. I was trying to get these things done. Uh, and I was also, um, I'm also the manager of the manual side of testing for QA over at Lucid. And so like, I had to figure out what that meant for all of the testers at Lucid. What would it look like? And so I actually, I used our program, created a very intense diagram of the different release cycles we should be expecting and um, what regression testing should look like in the future. And then I think that is the main bulk of my talk today. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, uh, about continuous deployment, that about what it took for us to get to weekly release at this point. Sorry, I don't I don't know if there's any microphone person going around. She asked, "Do we have native mobile apps, and are those continuously deployed?" Uh, we do have Android app and an iOS app. They are not at continuous deployment. They actually are at the same deployment uh, cycle as uh, our main product, so as our in-browser product. So uh, they are not, but we do have a lot of microservices that are now. So uh, I'm happy to talk to you more about our mobile apps later and what we do to get those deployed because there's two different, there's a native side and a server side release for those, and so it gets a little... It gets a little hairy with mobile. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Did you use one solution for building and while it's deploying, or did you find an easier way to deploy? Do we use one solution for building as well as deploying? Uh, so our builds are managed by Jenkins, I believe. Okay. And then our deploys are mostly. Ugh. I think we just use our own thing, like. I, I, I can't think of a name for it, which usually means like we just built something ourselves to figure it out. Uh, but we are trying to get to mostly automated deploys, not to production, because that's kind of scary. But um, the more we can just automate it, so like master is deployed to our master environment uh, every 15 minutes. Like there's an update automatically. No one has to touch it. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that was, we called them release trains. 
I'm happy to talk about that too with anyone after. Yeah, was there any friction trying to get people out of their bad habits? Yes, 100%. There's always going to be friction whenever you try to break a habit. Um, there was one instance where someone told me, uh, so like I said, the extra assistance in testing. Obviously, engineers probably don't want to manually test things some of the time. I, yes. <laughs> But there was friction there. There was obvious friction there. But like, so I started actually with the people who I knew there wouldn't be friction with, who I knew were on board and game to try anything to make things better. And like, they were the ones who set the example for the one, people who I knew like, okay, they've been in the industry for 30 years. They probably don't want to be testing. They probably just want to be developing. And that's fine. But like, it's just, you know, it was a two hour thing once a quarter. But like once I had um, a bunch of people on board, it actually became a lot more rare for people to be against it, if that makes sense. So, yeah. So, uh, how do you, uh, or how does your organization define business employment? Because I've heard many different ones. One of them being like 100 employees a day would be considered a, if you could, but not if you are, really those types of employees. So, are you asking? What is your company's definition of okay. What is my company's definition of continuous deployment? Uh, continuous deployment for us, so our pipeline is sort of a developer creates a branch. Uh, it gets code reviewed, it gets tested. The branch is then merged to a master branch, right? And then um, after a week, a release candidate branch is created off of the ma master branch. And that release candidate branch is what gets the regression test, what gets everything on it. Like we have to make sure, okay, this is ready for production. Our definition of that would be a developer branch goes to production. So that's what we're hoping to get to one day. It, like the really big thing that's stopping us right now um, is having our services be so large and so intertwined, so. Yeah, and there are a lot of our services that go dev branch, master production. Like, we, we have uh, broken up a lot of our smaller services to be able to do that. And those get tested pretty heavily, usually. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh. Uh, what further changes would we need to get to point something, for a dev team to put something straight to production? Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, so, again, microservices, that's the big obvious one. Um, uh, having a lot more people trained up in the ops sphere, like being comfortable making those calls and making those releases. Um, I would also say, uh, a lot more automation. So I don't fully believe that everything can be automated. Like there's always going to be some aspect of our product that we have to actually look at and make sure is working. Uh, and I'm happy to argue with anyone who thinks differently. I have no problem doing that um, as long as it's civil. Uh, and so like, you know, making sure that what QA has to do manually is very minimal compared to what's automated. Sorry, can you repeat that? How did I convince management to get individual test environments? Uh, Lucid's really cool about letting us do crazy things. And so like once I, like it wasn't just me, it was a lot of people here. But like once we made the case, like I, I usually find um, that if you make a case, you list out your points of reasons why you actually need something and why you're wasting a ton of money not doing it this way. 
then management tends to listen, especially if you can make that money argument a little bit. Um, and I'm fortunate enough, like our head of engineering is a super amazing understanding person who I can just grab, sit down with for 15 minutes and say, I need this resource, here's why. And he'll be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Let, let's try that. And like he's always willing to give something a try. So uh, I, I'm happy to talk about other ideas if that's not going to work with the kind of management you have. Anything else? Oh, sorry, do we still have time? Okay. I'm excited. Oh, I should show you my document afterwards because this is the document I was, sorry, he asked uh, how did going to weekly deploys affect our sprint cycle? So we're on a two-week sprint cycle, which is why we used to release every two weeks because everyone was on the same two-week sprint cycle. And so this was actually the main thing I did, and it was pretty big, of uh, splitting up our development teams into two sections. Uh, we had, I called it Bear and Eagle. I'm happy to share, like show the basics of the document with anyone who wants to see. But like we had half of our development teams on a one-two cycle and then another on a two-three cycle. I'm not sure if that's the best way to explain it, but my document explains it really well, so I'm happy to show that to you afterwards. I think that's it. All right, big applause, right?